Hey everyone, welcome back to More Than Work this week. I just have a few things to talk about before we get into the episode. And they are about the episode though, so at least it's all relevant. Uh, This week, I'm going to present an interview with a high school friend who we saw each other at the 20 year reunion and we're connected on social media, but I haven't really caught up with her or almost anyone in this way. I mean, it's really cool just to talk about what she's been up to. She's a public school educator, a teacher. She teaches Spanish and she's in the union. And I have to say on the subject of public school and public education, I'm completely a product of the public school system all the way up through college. I went to University of California, San Diego, which is a public university. And we went to Valencia High School in Santa Clarita. And before that, I went to Saugus High School. And I went to Castaic Middle School, Castaic Elementary School, Pine Tree Elementary School, and Emblem Elementary School. I think that covers all of them. And I think teaching has to be one of the most difficult professions to do. We get a little bit into it, or quite a bit into it, on our conversation So I really hope any teachers listening or parents of students or even people who used to be students, because all of us can at least attest to that, really pay attention and really appreciate the work of teachers. Sarah, my guest, talks through what she sees her role in students' lives as and also talks through teaching now in this time of COVID and in the time last year during our you know, basically time of unrest, a time of understanding what anti-racism is. It's Black History Month. It was founded in February because it's the month that Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln were born. It's been celebrated for many, many years, and I can only say it's a coincidence that my guest is going to talk about her experience as a person of color, as a black woman, both as an educator and before when she was a student in school, and we talk a bit about anti-racism. I'm really proud that we're able to have these conversations and I'm able to stumble into them and through them a little bit with someone and that they trust me with talking about it. It's really an honor. Um, it's a frank conversation I hope it's informative to people. I hope it helps people. Also, just on the subject of educators in public schools, it's been a tough time for educators. I will say that I still keep in touch with some teachers I had in junior high and high school and even got to encounter some of them when I was living back in my hometown about two years ago. I got to thank one of them. There was a teacher named Jackie Arnold and she was my AP English teacher and I don't know what she remembers of me I remember her being kind of hard on me at one point because I was always doing things last minute which for the record I'm recording this two days ahead of schedule so I feel like I've made some progress at least this week maybe just so I could make that statement but that was an important class for me I've always loved writing I actually passed the AP test I'll never forget that because I was really proud I mean that was one of the proudest things I experienced in high school and she really made an impact. She just treated us like people like, and respected us and our age that we were at and where we were going next. And it was, I don't know. I just think that she's one of the best teachers I had. I have a PE teacher from junior high, Mrs. Allman that I'm still in touch with and she's become a friend and she dedicated her entire life to teaching and to her students. And she, went into administration for a while. And I just always appreciated what she did for us too and how she, I I didn't like PE. I'm still not a big physical activity person, although I do ride my bike. And she was again, just someone who even in junior high treated us like real people. And the last teacher that I need to mention is Mark Evans, who he, he's an administrator now. He's the CFO of a district, but He was my algebra teacher, and he had this sign above the door 
of the classroom and you'd see it when you leave, you know, make your lives extraordinary is from Dead Poet Society. And he was kind and he was funny and has this sense of humor that now as an adult, I can appreciate and now that we're friends because we're both adults and um, I'm really an adult now. I mean, it's, you know, probably 25 or almost 30 years since he was my teacher. Uh, and I still appreciate the conversations I can have with him, but I could have those conversations, some of them when I was a kid, just thinking about the world and thinking about how things were. And he was my algebra teacher, but we could talk about anything. And it made an impact the fact that he cared, the fact that he, again, respected us as people. And I got that from Sarah talking to her and how she treats her students and seeing some of the material she sends to her students I know she's a teacher that's making an impact. I know she's a teacher that someone 20 years or so from now will remember, hey, Senor, Senora Robinson, she's a Spanish teacher, right? So I got it. Or no, Senorita Robinson, probably. I didn't, not Senora. I didn't do well in Spanish. I'm going to leave that mistaken because it's, you know, it's me. It's just a small error. But anyway, they'll remember her. And if you haven't lately, thank a teacher. If you are a teacher, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. I hope you enjoy this talk. I hope you get something out of it. Uh, please let me know. There's, I think, a way for you to record on anchor.fm slash more than work pod if you want to record feedback for me. And you can also email me. But I really appreciate everyone listening. I appreciate the time that this guest gave me and all my guests have given me. So enjoy the show. Welcome to More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is defined by more than your job title. I'm Rabia, an IT project manager, comedian, nonprofit volunteer, and sometimes activist. Every week, I'll chat with a guest about pursuing passions outside of work or creating meaningful opportunities inside the workplace. As you listen, I hope you'll be inspired to do the same. Joining me this week is someone I'm really excited to talk to. We actually went to high school together, and now she is a high school teacher, and she's vice president of the Redondo Beach Teachers Association. Sarah Robinson. Hey, Sarah, how's it going? Hey, Robbie. Good to talk to you. It's been a long time. <laughs> it has. It has. And now I've made it into a formal interview instead of a regular catch up. Right. Right, so. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah. To the listeners? Um, so, yeah, like you said, my name is Sarah Robinson. Um, I'm originally from Santa Clarita. That's where we met, where I grew up. My parents still live there. And then uh, through a lot of adventures. I went to college at USC. I lived in London, like you're living now. I lived in London for a year to go to uh, graduate school. And I kind of wound my way through different places and ended up as a public school teacher in New York City. Um, and that's where I started my career. I taught middle school Spanish there for a couple of years. Um, and fell in love with teaching, really liked living in New York, but wanted to come back to Southern California. And so I moved here to the South Bay, um, which is like a little bit south and west of like downtown Los Angeles, right on the coast. Um, and I've been here since 2006. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I teach high school Spanish here and I, a couple of years into teaching really got involved in my local union, like as a site rep. And like you mentioned, now I'm the vice president of our local association. And I'm also, um, uh, uh an elected state representative for our state union. Um, so I sit, uh, as a representative there. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, kind of where I've been the last, you know, just 20 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's just keep it at 20 yeah. just so we don't Or know. so. <laughs> or so. I actually um, work with um, someone that you went to ninth grade with, uh, Jen. Yeah. Jen, uh, what was her name before? Pollock, I think was her maiden Pollock. name. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So 
Oh, okay. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, we did. And my sister's good friends with her sister. Yeah, we've worked together for like 10 years. She teaches math. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. See, so yeah, small world. Mm-hmm. So what's cool, I think, and one reason we're chatting is because I think, first of all, I, I'm excited to have someone in education on here. I think education, and I'm going to have actually a guest probably after this. So if listeners, maybe you'll catch me in a lie because it could be before this <laughs> actually airs, but who uh, also was in education before, but now she's running a nonprofit. And what I'm excited to talk to you about is just the fact that because education, the equity or inequity in our society, I think really starts in education. And I'm really excited to talk to you about not only your work in the classroom, but also your work as a union rep and as a state rep. So uh, what brought you, I guess, first of all, I want to say almost into teaching Spanish, because I know for me, I stopped taking Spanish and it's like a big regret. But what I guess brought you into teaching and then maybe further getting an education further in Spanish to teach that? Yeah, so I actually did not start uh, in education as my first career. Um, I went to graduate school uh, at the London School of Economics and actually got a master's degree in European studies. And I had this idea that I was going to work at a think tank studying European policy. And I learned two things. Number one, Americans don't care about European policy because there's one think tank in our entire country dedicated to it. And on the other side, Europeans don't care what Americans think about their policy. So they were like, (laughs) yeah, no, we don't need you here to help us. I was like, all right. So I got kind of a corporate job and like it was fine. But I just at the end of the day, like didn't really care about the work I was doing. And that was something that was important to me. And a friend of mine just randomly suggested like, why don't you do be a substitute teacher? And I was like, what? They're like, your job is not like full time. You could substitute Mm teach. And I was like, all right. So at that time, I was living in Santa Clarita. And so I got a job with the Heart District, substitute teaching. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because my brother was actually a senior in high school uh, at that same year. So I never substituted for him, but I did substitute in a class that had his friends in it. Anyway, like two weeks into it, a teacher, a principal at Canyon High School called me and he's like, we have a Spanish teacher who's going to go on maternity leave. Would you be interested? And I minored in Spanish in college. I studied abroad in Spain. I was like, okay. And so I met with her like one time and then I was, I was the teacher, you know, for a couple of months. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing, but I realized I really liked it, you know? And so I went to the principal after he's like, you know, we really were happy with the job you did. We have an opening. Would you be interested next year? At this point, I had no credential. I had, you know, no nothing. And so I said, well, what would I have to do? I'd have to get the credential, all this stuff. And at the end of the day, I didn't really want to teach in Santa Clarita. I really didn't want to live there anymore. And so I found this program that's called the New York City Teaching Fellows. That's for people who are career changers or fresh out of college. You commit to two years of teaching in New York City public schools anywhere. They subsidize your teaching credential and your master's in education. So I applied. I'd never been to New York. I applied, went for my interview. Then they called me and were like, okay, you're accepted. So I moved to New York. And then that's where I started teaching. And they look at your educational experience and see what you're qualified to teach and what are the high needs areas. So I, my bachelor's degree is in international relations. My master's in European studies they're like, we don't need history teachers. So we need Spanish. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so that's kind of how, you know, Sp- speaking Spanish has always been important to me, but that's kind of how it became my career too. Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's actually, that's really cool. And it's cool. You found a program like you did in New York as well, because a lot of times when education or something is subsidized, it's actually a longer term than two years. Yeah. too. So, and that can get pretty daunting. So that's, that's awesome. So then with just teaching Spanish and, and being a teacher for quite a few years now, what's changed for you just from that start where you didn't really have experience teaching and it wasn't something you thought about doing to now? Like what, what kind of things have you kind of evolved, I guess, in how you teach and what you're doing? I think probably the biggest thing you learn the more years you have is not to worry about small things. When you first start out teaching, you're like trying to control everything. Like, oh my God, what if this kid like, you know, has a hat on and he won't take his hat off? Like, what do I do? How do I, you know, that kind of stuff or, you know, just little small things. And the more experience you have, you realize like 
you got to pick your battles. You know, you only have so much time, you know, in some schools on their schedule, you have, you know, 45 minutes with the kids or 50 minutes. Are you going to spend 10 minutes talking to a kid about, you know, wearing a hat or not, or having a hood on his head? Like that kind of stuff for me is like, that's not important, you know, like, so I think as you develop, you realize that you also, as you become more um, comfortable in your content, whatever your content is, your kind of planning process can become very streamlined. Like I remember when I first started, I had like binders of like fully written out lesson plans, like a script of like, I will say this, then I will pass out this assignment to kids. They will spend seven minutes working on it. I will do that, you know? And so now pre-COVID, obviously it got to the point where sometimes my lesson plan was like a post-it note and it was just like scribbled, like this idea, this idea, this idea, because I already had done them and kind of had it developed in my mind how it would go. Yeah. That's that's cool. And actually, it's funny just because I can relate that to comedy, even like I was first writing out my whole thing ahead of time. And it would take, you know, for a five minute set, which is nothing, it would take about an hour and a half right. to write up the thing and word for word. And now it, it's just uh, it's just I'll show you. Actually, I have one here because I do this is where I do comedy and podcast <laughs> and work. I have just a strip of paper with just the right. ideas. Yeah, same right? thing. And sometimes less. Yeah, so that's good. So I can teach. Yeah, you're ready to go. Hey, we need substitutes right now. So <laughs> and we're distance <laughs> learning. So you could do it from anywhere. <laughs> Middle of the night in London, yeah. I'm teaching. Um, no, so that's that's cool. So then speaking of picking your battles, though, then when you moved back to California and you were teaching and you moved into high school teaching, too, um, at what point did you then decide to get involved in the union side of things more? So it was probably my second year uh, once I became, got permanent status, um, or some people say tenure. We usually don't use tenure Mm -hmm. in in secondary level. Um, But yeah, once I got my permanent status. So I didn't really know a lot about unions. When I was in New York, obviously their union is there. The New York City Department of Education is the biggest one in the country with over, you know, a million students. Um, And so their union, you have a lot of benefits just because there's so many members like my health as a single person, my health benefits were paid for. I got to go to a ton of trainings like right away. And it was all my union. And I worked at a really small, great school, but very small. And so there were lots of extra duties teachers had to do because there was no one to do one do them. And it was our union rep. She was a very veteran special ed teacher. And when our principal would say like, "Okay, I need you guys to do this, 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 this. She was always the one who kind of stood up and said, like, oh, you know, they only have to be there till five. You can only do this, whatever, you know. And I knew no differently, but she was always standing up for us. And some people kind of got frustrated by that. But I was like, hey, she's looking out for us. Then fast forward to now I'm in Redondo and I get a flyer in my mailbox about running for a site rep. And I kind of thought about it and I was like, well, you know, I think that could be, you know, something to kind of help out those people who are now newer and, you know, that kind of stuff. So I signed up and, you know, ran a close election, AKA my name was on a sheet and there was like, I think six <laughs> spots, spots available and four of us ran. So, you know, yeah. I was elected and started to learn about how it works and our contract. And then like, I think I was a site rep for two years and then our president contacted me and she, I was nervous. She like called me and I was like, oh, what's going on? And she said that, you know, she was planning to retire and kind of our vice president was going to move up. And would I be interested in serving as like the recording secretary? And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and so that was, I think that was like 10, 12 years ago. Um, and since then, I've kind of done every kind of position in our union. Right now I'm the vice president. I'm the, also the bargaining chair. So I head our negotiations. Um, and then same thing, someone gave me a, an application of like, have you thought about being on state council? You know, that's kind of how union work <laughs> operates since it's mostly volunteer that we always joke, you have to find your own replacement. So if someone's been doing a job and they're either retiring or they're moving on to something else, they have to find someone else. And so then sometimes mm-hmm. you get voluntold <laughs> like hey <laughs> we really want you to do this and it's like okay you know and then you try it so that's kind of how up each level I've I've been moving awesome and I think I like the fact that you seem to have a theme that I'm getting is that you've just been open to having a conversation open to the idea of seeing yourself in a different position than you were in yeah before and I'd say that just thinking about you living in Spain and 
London, Spain, New York. I mean, these are all hard things to do too. just move from city to city. And we grew up, uh, people who don't know Santa Clarita, I mean, it's not the same. It's Well, it's very similar to what you see on the Santa Clarita diet, <laughs> to be honest, on Netflix. I mean, other than the cannibalism, uh, I'd say we didn't experience that per se, but it's very similar to that, but it's a small town. And then you, you go from these different places. So all that being said, and kind of probably off topic, what have you found as far as the union goes and being on the state level too, has this changed your perspective on your career overall as a teacher and an educator and how you even work with students? Like, does that translate at all? Oh, for sure. It's, it's really opened my eyes so much. And it's an experience I wish a lot of my colleagues would have because as teachers, we do get like super siloed, you know, where you're in your classroom working with your content, with your whatever number of kids. Um, but working the union work that I've done has really opened my eyes to not only the disparities that we have in California of how different the educational experience is for kids and for educators, the different working conditions they have, um, but also just how the power that we have to work together to improve our conditions for our students. You know, we saw two years ago during during the UTLA strike here, like just power of educators and students, because there were students out on those picket lines to really work together to improve their conditions, you know, asking for more counselors in their schools, um, improving the funding. So that's something that really, I feel like it's opened my eyes to the bigger system of education in California. And then I try to use that lens sometimes when I work with my students of, you know, Let's not just think about talking about ourselves here in, you know, our small beach community. Like, what else do we Welcome need to, to learn more than about work. the, the podcast the reminding you wider that your self worth is defined you? by and more I try than to your bring job that in my language skills. I'm Robbie, and I try to tell an them, IT like, project you know, manager, you're comedian, learning this language to go out and volunteer, and, people, and sometimes activists uh, who may be Every different week, than you. I'll chat with your guests about pursuing passions outside of work. And or so that's creating gonna meaningful allow opportunities the inside to, the workplace. You know, experience As you listen, new. so that's I hope I you'll be inspired to, to do the same. You, one thing I was just thinking about is, is there an experience that you had in school, in high school or earlier, that stuck with you that you were thinking, I'm going to make sure no other student ever has an experience like that now that I'm doing this? Has that happened? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I had... Um, obviously you know the demographics of the high school where we went, but Mm -hmm. there were very few uh, Black students in in our high school. If I go to count in our senior class, I think there were two female Black students, maybe three. Um, So I was very often the only Black student in my class, you know, for years at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, it's something as a teenager, you maybe don't always recognize those microaggressions of getting comments like, oh, you're so articulate. Oh, you're so well-spoken or, you know, asking me about my hair and that kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm. so those are things that I think I didn't really, at the time they felt just like awkward. As an adult, you kind of realize where that's coming from as people, you know, who have had never had contact with black people or, you know, the con the connotations they have of what a black person is, I didn't match it. So for them, they mm-hmm. had to, you know, like let me know that and think that it was something I cared about. So that's something as an adult, <laughs> I think back and it's actually interesting because we have a re- relatively small black population at my school now. And that's something that I never want them to feel, right? I mm-hmm. always want those students to feel that they are valued, that they can go anywhere they want. They can do anything that they want. Well, one thing I noticed, and you shared some, you know, some information with me that helped me research this chat and your video. So you created, so let's first of all state, you know, we're still in COVID. Mm -hmm. Your classes, your school, how long have you guys been out of the classroom? March 13th was our last normal day of school. Um, and okay. so, yeah, on that day, I said, hey, students, see you on Monday. And that was the last time I was in person with students. Oh, so bizarre. So that's 10, almost 10 months now. Yeah. So things change. So what you shared with me was a YouTube you created for your students to, I guess, welcome them to the new year. Mm-hmm. And and what I noticed in that video was you talked to them like adults. You didn't talk to them like they were kids, and which is really important 
but you also talk to them about respect for themselves and for others and things like that. And so can you just talk a little bit about your approach to teaching and how you, what you consider your relationship to your students to be? And you already spoke a little bit about like, you want them to know they can go anywhere and do anything. Yeah. So I did start teaching middle school and I realized after two years that that was not a good fit for my personality um, because uh, I'm much, I'm pretty sarcastic and middle school kids, you have to walk that balance where they still need a little of the kind of like elementary school mom type coddling. Um, But also, especially in New York, like a 12 year old in New York is like kind of like a 16 year old West Coast kid. So it's like it was a tough balance. So I was like, this isn't for me. So then I moved to high school, which is a better fit. Um, yeah, I would say that my uh, kind of philosophy when I work with students is you're right, I do in a lot of ways try to talk to them like adults, you know, and I think that's important because I think a lot of times people underestimate teenagers and they think that, you know, they don't know how to form opinions and, you know, they can't make decisions, which is not true. You know, I'm constantly amazed by the stuff that my students come up with. Now, the other side is, yes, they are still teenagers and Sometimes their brains are not fully developed and, you know, you have to guide them through thinking through their actions and like, what are the consequences? But I do try to treat them in that way. And I think I try to let kids know that I'm always there for them, whether it's academically or not, you know, if they are having issues and they need someone to talk to. One of my first couple of years at Redondo, I had a student who was pregnant. And she came to me and said, like, I don't know what to do. Like, and actually the father was also a student of mine. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so I kind of realized in that moment, and that was still earlier in my career, probably like in my first five years, that like, that's an important part of my job is like, it wasn't my job to tell her what to do. It was my job to listen to her and kind of give her options and, and, and support her and what her choice was. So that's something I try to do. And I think probably the biggest thing is I try to show my students that there's a world beyond them and to help them connect with that in whatever way is like important to them. You know, for some kids, they're socially active. Some kids, like they're really into, you know, like culture and social media. And I try and, you know, connect them to things they might like that broadens their horizon. So that's, I think, an important part of my teaching philosophy is just opening their eyes to things they might not have seen before. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And it's, I mean, you, I remember, and it depends on what people's home life is like during high school and, or even like their friend circles. But yeah, there were some teachers that you just kind of connect with differently and you do seek out and it's same as an adult, I guess, and work and stuff. But yeah, it's an important relationship that I don't think is valued as much as it should be, you know? Yeah. And I think um, I'm a little bit different too. Like there are some of my colleagues who are very, who are very close to the kids and it's, more like a personal relationship, you know, I call them the huggers, like who they'll see the kids yeah, yeah. and they hug and they chit chat with them. Like, I'm not like that. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get in there and gossip with you and be like, what are you guys doing this weekend? Like, mm-hmm. that's not my role, you know, like I'll support you and I'll, you know, be happy for you, but I'm not going to get myself in there. But if it's something serious, 100% I'm there, you know, to help you. So I try and yeah. maintain those boundaries. <laughs> yeah. It's healthy boundaries. Too. Well, yeah. And uh, yeah you have I'm just thinking of other stuff but yes you have to have boundaries with students for sure yeah. and that's good I mean it's good you as a person know how to do that as well um and I'm sure it's hard because if if you don't I mean and you see certain things happen it's really hard yeah yeah so the that all brings me then to the last year which um you know you did talk about now we talked a little bit about in high school and yeah I, I'm not surprised to hear at all what your experience was and having become more aware of even the word anti-racist rather than just being, just saying I'm not racist Mm -hmm. versus being anti-racist. And that's something admittedly, I'm, you know, and not something I'm proud of, but I'll say I've never thought of myself as racist at all, but I certainly know I haven't been anti-racist. Right. And I, and it's just kind of a thing where a lot of people had to learn a lot and, and I don't think a lot of people admit it, but we've had to. Um, but as an educator, dealing with these really tough things this year and just thinking about, I don't know how a, a kid was processing everything. I know as an adult, it was very hard to process. 
what ended up happening? And, you know, I know you guys have done some work also training teachers and anti-racist teaching and stuff, but just anything you want to talk about in that regard and how it's manifested would be great. Yeah, no, it's definitely been a challenge. And I mean, I myself have had to come over these last, you know, however many 10 months it's been um, with a reckoning with my own feelings about, about race and, and my history and what I've thought and the racist thoughts that I had about other members of the black community based on my own, you know, my own prejudices and what I thought, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, And so, yeah, we, I would say have been really, I would say pretty active in my, in my district. Um, I spoke during the summer, actually, I went to a school board meeting and I spoke about the importance of anti-racist education in our district and how we had to commit to it. Um, And one of the biggest issues for me in our district that's within our control, because obviously there's a lot of things that are not within the control of a school district, but in ours, it is our hiring practices. So Mm -hmm. I, our staff at my high school is about 120 teachers. Of those 120 teachers, there are four black teachers. One of those teaches in an AP class. Two of them teach special ed. There's me. And we have a black assistant principal. And so one of the things I said to our school board is, what is that saying to our primarily non-black student population about Mm -hmm. what is a good teacher? Because we talk over and over about the high quality of the, the teachers that we have, which is true. We have, you know, a fantastic, um, fantastically skilled educational staff. But what is that telling them, right, of who are the best teachers? And especially when we get into our high performing classes, what are we telling them about who is the best to teach them those difficult subjects? It's not mm-hmm. people of color, right? So that's something for me that I, I really spoke to our district about, that that's important for our students to see black people in those professions. And they did, they created a a race and social equity committee that they're, you know, working on some stuff. Um, I think also really looking as teachers at our curriculum, who are we like highlighting? So in Spanish, we use a lot of pictures, right? You know, like Uh showing family and this and items or whatever. And I do a unit on careers and Last year, I was going through and getting some, you know, images of like different careers and, you know, I'm Google imaging like judge, lawyer, scientist, whatever. (laughs) And I like had a minute where I looked at my list. They were all white because when I just quickly Google scientist, you get a person. And so that's like a conscious decision that I have now made in my curriculum is the visuals that I'm going to show my students. I want to be people of color. And so Mm -hmm. it's kind of some small changes, like our English department has really like blown up their curriculum and they're really trying to incorporate, you know, you don't just have to read To Kill a Mockingbird when you teach about racism, like there's other stuff Mm -hmm. you can read. And so they've really, uh, you know, uh, taken a dive into that and trying to diversify their curriculum. So, you know, there's lots of different things. Like I think sometimes people get caught up in like, oh my God, anti-racism is this huge thing and I can't control this whole system. But if you kind of start with what's close to you and like make those changes, and but the first change has to come in your own mindset, right? You have to kind of accept the things that you have thought and that you have, you know, like you said, ways that you haven't actively worked against racism and make a commitment to do that. And then you start with small things, you know, no one's saying the first thing you have to do is, you know, march on, you know, wherever, but right. to start thinking about, well, what's my circle of friends? Do I have any black friends? Do I, you know, listen to any black media? Do I consume any, you know, black news sources? Like those are things everyone can do. I mean, I don't know how Mm -hmm. easy it is to find a black friend depending on where you live. (laughs) Well, (laughs) yeah, that's true. And then also just like, I can just imagine like someone like me, hi, do you want to be, (laughs) you're black. (laughs) They're like, what? <laughs> yeah. You're gonna that tough but, line. <laughs> but no, it's true. And I think I don't know. I mean, it, it it's a tough, it's really tough because and I don't I don't get into my I mean, I think it's obvious what my politics are in most conversations, but I don't get into them much on this podcast because that's not what it's about. But you know, I, I I've considered myself a liberal for a long time. I've actively done voter registration, stuff like that. And 
it was it was a matter of just reckoning though with like you know yeah these are things i've said or done or don't do or whatever and then of course what am i doing now telling a black person that <laughs> like that's the you know so that's like not annoying but it's but it's been interesting from the perspective of like just learning more about it and i think the sooner kids see that and and you're right like seeing educators that look more like them and i mean one thing I've been looking at too is like what the incoming government's going to look like and it's going to look a lot different Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are going to see themselves now and it's so important and have you but one thing I mean saying all that and I'm even worried like now okay I've said this so did someone turn this off and if they did well see ya you know have a nice have a nice day (laughs) you know but have you there's all this resistance to these ideas though too like if I if if you say you know well we need to hire a more diverse staff or teachers someone else will say okay well what so what we just hire people just because they're not white yeah and those kind of have you heard any of that resistance in the education community or um i think the most of what we hear a lot from some people sometimes who don't want to have those difficult conversations because they are difficult is they say mm-hmm you know, well, we shouldn't involve politics. Like we shouldn't be talking politics. We should, you know, we're just here to teach like this kind of stuff. And, and I think one of the things that I respond is number one, when I'm talking amongst my colleagues, we're public employees. Mm -hmm. So the makeup of our government has a direct effect on our working conditions. So that's not Mm -hmm. talking politics. That's, you know, discussing our work conditions. When we're in the classroom and people say again, like, well, I don't want to, we shouldn't be talking politics. I looked a colleague right in the face and I said, I'm a black woman living in America. Me talking Mm -hmm. about strategies to have a safer life for people who look like me is not politics, you know? And I said, I asked this colleague, I said, do you have any black students? And they said, yes. And I said, how can you not advocate? for them to have the best education possible, the safest life possible, and the best, like the most future opportunities possible. Like, Mm -hmm. how can you not do that for them? And the way to do that is you have to say that things haven't been that way for them in the past. We have to recognize that and work to do it. I said, that to me is not politics. That is advocating for our students, especially in California. I mean, you can't say like, well, we don't need to worry about those things when you look at, you know, the majority of our students in public schools in California are black and brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how can it not be an issue? One thing I think is cool is that there have been initiatives to basically educate other educators, Mm -hmm. right. And help them with how to make changes like you've made. So can you, you've made, so can you talk a little bit about like those kind of efforts? I think it, it trend, it would translate into other parts other businesses and stuff. I know I've seen it. The parent company I work for, they've done a lot of, of work now and they're, they're making an effort to do that. And that's even in England. Yeah. So it wasn't just in the U S but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one, if we want to look at one of the benefits of the pandemic and our, you know, keeping us at home is CTA, our California teachers association has really been active in virtual events. And so in the past, you know, you would have to pay to like, go to a different city, maybe get a hotel room, get a sub one day. Whereas now from the comfort of your home, you can watch a two hour webinar. Um, So we uh, started this program during the summer called Takeover Tuesdays for Racial and Social Justice. And so we would have a different, um, you know, kind of theme. And we talked about anti-racist education. We did one that was really interesting on how to be an anti-racist educator in a more conservative area. And so we had Mm. some speakers from Bakersfield, from the Inland Empire, and kind of talk about some of the different struggles they had had and kind of ways they had to be creative with their language. I thought that was really interesting um, to kind of hear how it was a little bit different for them. We, uh, so my area is called Bay Valley, and we've actually partnered up with uh, Imperial County down like closer to the border and inland. Mm. Um, And we're doing this equity book and video series discussion. And so we did one on anti-racism. We have one later this month on colorism, uh, where we read this book and we're going to kind of discuss. So CTA has been very active in doing that kind of stuff and maximizing the fact that people care about it. Our members do really care about it. And we kind of 
have have the time right now to do it. But I know a lot of <laughs> industries, like for example, my brother um, is a physical therapist, and they, you know, same thing as kind of I've faced is there are very few black physical therapists. Um, and so he uh, he got his PhD at USC and they've created an entire kind of organization of black physical therapists who are really working, same thing with mentorship um, to get you know more people of color in into their profession and through kind of the process. Um, and then also advocating for themselves when they're in the workplace as physical therapists and how do they, you know, have more of an equity lens in their profession, kind of looking at where they work, because, you know, there's such a range of some physical therapists work in, you know, very high priced, you know, type areas, like my brother works at a county rehabilitation mm-hmm. center. And so most of his patients are black and brown. And so, you know, they kind of work to be sure they provide the best care, whoever the patient is. So yeah, I think a lot of other industries are kind of taking those steps and really looking at, you know, what are our internal practices? What does that say about us? You know, if mm-hmm. everyone who's on the executive suite looks like, you know, a white male, what does that say? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it is, I want to, the word funny, it's funny. It's funny, like um, peculiar that sometimes there's resistance to these ideas because in any case, when you get more perspectives, you end up with better ideas. That's it. And if, like you said, if the perspectives, well, you didn't say this, but like you said, if everyone's the same color and gender on a board, you're going to get that perspective. And that's the only one you're going to get. And you're probably not going to get very diverse as far as ideas go right. either. Right. So that's, it's just been a learning, you know, over time, I think that people are starting to come to and, you know, there's different ways of doing it, setting quotas and stuff, but it's also just really like deciding that for your business or for your school or whatever, that that's important to you. Yeah. Well, or like sometimes it just makes business sense. Like how many fashion companies have we seen over the last couple of years that have like put out a product that instantly people, you know, are, are boycotting and protesting. And you look at it and you're like, if you would have just had one black person in the room, they would have told you that that monkey sweater is not going to work or, you know, that weird, one of them, like the weird face covering or something like yes. people would have said, no, Nike, actually, I use this in my class, uh, is Nike produced this shoe. This was like two years ago, I think. And it was supposed to honor, it was after the hurricanes and it was supposed to honor Puerto Rico and like their heritage and tradition and all this stuff. And the design that they put on the shoe is actually a traditional Panamanian craft called a mola. Um, and I show my students because we do a big unit about Panama because I lived there for years and I love it. Uh-huh. And so that's what I teach them about. And so I put it up and I showed them and I just showed them like the cu- the title that like, oh, Nike has the shoe honoring Puerto Rico. And I asked them, I was like, what seems wrong here? And they're like, isn't that that craft from Panama? And I was like, yeah. I was like, no you guys now all know that after, you know, your high school students in my Spanish class. This means that Nike, a bajillion dollar company, didn't have one person who knew enough about traditions of Latin America to be like, um, FYI, that's not Puerto Rican. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. That's so that's so embarrassing. Yeah. Too. It. So I in my day job, like I work mo- mostly on websites. And so there was this icon used to represent something right to click on, on a website, but it had these like two squiggly lines that were separated, but I didn't know, but someone in QA realized that that looks like a Nazi symbolism that was used, but like for the SS, but it wasn't like a swastika. Mm -hmm. I mean, Oh, those little like kind of like lightning bolt. Yeah. 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 And he's like, Hey, Robbie, I don't know if I should even put a ticket in for this. (laughs) I'm very uncomfortable. And I so I look it up, so I'm sure my work search history is great now. <laughs> right. you know? like, not because of them. Uh but it, even that, I mean it was like, you know, it fine. Maybe no one from Germany would go on that site ever or something. And he happened to know because he had been there at some point, kind of similar to you with the uh Panama thing. And it's just it is interesting. I mean, and you you do lose those perspectives for sure. But yeah, I didn't Gucci do some shoes too. Yeah. I know that one really was like I just could even <laughs> yeah <laughs> believe um yeah no so that's that's cool and as far as like 
have you gotten feedback from students or have you seen anything? Yeah. Just has there been any indication from students like about the, the work you guys have been doing, the changes you guys have been trying to make, like, are they aware of it or are they just kind of? Um, I don't know how many of them are aware. I mean, obviously they are aware of the discussions that have happened. You know, a lot of them saw me on the school board, you know, cause those are public meetings. Um, and I think they've heard about it. My students are going to hear about it uh, very uh, overtly next week because we're starting a unit on Afro-Latinos. And I'm mm-hmm. very open about telling them, like, I'm your Black Spanish teacher. And I think this is extremely important. And I may be the only Black teacher you have in these four years. So that's why we're learning this, <laughs> you know. So yeah. they're going to hear very directly. Um but I think they probably started to notice, I would say, overall in our curriculum, probably especially in their English classes, because I know that um, most of our English cl- teachers have really made an effort to kind of change up the different perspectives they, that they share and telling the kids why it's important to have a variety of perspectives. Mm-hmm. And did any of this work start before George Floyd and Rhonda Taylor and people like that? Or do you feel like it, that was really the catalyst for it? I think that was, that was really the catalyst. That was the cat. I mean, we started a little bit, I actually, based on our previous, her outgoing administration, um, mm-hmm. we had talked a lot about, cause I, previous to that, I have do a unit on El Salvador and we read this book about El Salvador mm-hmm. and we talk about the culture and everything. Um, and when he made those comments about, you know, like the shithole countries and I was referring to that, you know, I really made a point to my students to talk about, like, you have been spending the last couple of months learning about El Salvador. Luckily enough, we have, you know, a lot of uh, pupuserias here in the South Bay that they went to restaurants and talked to people who worked there and that kind of stuff. And I was like, you've seen, you know, how great those people are. Like at one restaurant, they invited my students into the kitchen and we're like showing them how to make pupusas and stuff. And I said, you've seen how warm these people are. You've learned about their difficult history and what they've had to overcome. And so when you hear anyone, whether it's your parent or a coworker or the president of the United States, like speaking badly about these people and telling lies, it's your job to speak up. And that was, I think, the first time. And that was in like, what was that, like 2017 or 18, maybe you said that, that I kind of made a specific commitment to be like, wait a minute, I need to kind of address these things. But yeah, obviously... Um, the the events over the summer with George Floyd and for me the with Breonna Taylor was what was mm-hmm. the strongest one for me that I was like I cannot teach the same as I did before and I know a lot of my colleagues have really felt that way too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it was just I think it the only positive outcome of all that of people losing their lives was that it did I think wake quite a few people up mm-hmm. who even innocuously might have been or thinking they were being innocuous in, in their racism or attitudes and then also just changing education and how we manage at work and everything. So, um, so one thing I think that's cool that you just talked about now is you have your students go out in the community and meet people from different, I guess, um, Latin country, Latin countries and, I don't know the right. Now I'm like, oh, is, am I right? Are they Latin American? <laughs> they are. They are. Yeah. Okay, good, good. I got it right. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, gosh, geography. Uh, so, and I think, does that partly come from just the fact that you have traveled and lived other places and how that, yeah, how does that Yeah, I think so. I mean, life? we do have, we do that at all of our levels where they have to, we call it CPR, cultural participation and research. They have to kind of get out and do something. And um I added, so I teach a Spanish four course that didn't exist before. And so I've developed it. And so one of the benefits of that is I get to decide (laughs) what we teach. And so I decided that one of our semesters, we would focus on El Salvador, number one, because, you know, it has a huge impact on our community here in Los Angeles, you know, the, the amount of immigration that has happened between the U.S. and El Salvador. Um, And also, you know, it doesn't get talked about a lot. And so I found this novel that talks about the the creation of the Mara Sabatrucha, the gang. Um, and it also has a love story involved. But I, I teach it because, especially again, with the words of our previous president, um, this idea that, you know, everyone from El Salvador is a gang member who's like coming to murder you, which is <laughs> not factually true. And this book shows like 
actually the gang started here in Los Angeles and was then exported to Central America. But also I try to show them like how great a country El Salvador is. And I went there before I started teaching about it. I took a, a trip there. And, you know, learned about their culture and and traveled around. And so then I show them my own pictures and I talk about, you know, one of the big questions is, is it safe? And I, you know, I don't sugarcoat it. And I say, yeah, there's a lot of issues, but also it's an awesome country. And, you know, we're so lucky that so many people from El Salvador have come here that we can now experience their culture, too. And one of the um, I was mentioning the kids. And so I had this was about three years ago, two students, very outgoing. Their Spanish was pretty good. I mean, not great, but they had no fear to talk to anyone in Spanish. They would just go out. And so they went to a, a little pupuseria. And I always tell them when they go to the restaurant, I'm like, speak in Spanish, talk to the people, tell them you're there for a project. They'll love to help you. And that's what they did. And this like older lady and her husband who ran this little restaurant, it wasn't very busy. They brought them back in. They're making a video of them making pupusas all in Spanish. They're like dancing in the kitchen, you know, like that kind of stuff. And then in part of the project, they have to like write a reflection. What did you learn? How did this go? Whatever. And like, I still have a picture of what they wrote because they talked about like, I didn't know anything about El Salvador before. All I'd heard was stuff, bad stuff. And, you know, we learned about how great their culture is and their food was great. And he's like, and then when I met these people, like they were so nice to me. And he put, he's like, they didn't even make fun of my Spanish. And I know my Spanish isn't good, um, but just that <laughs> idea And I tried to tell them that I was like, when you get out in the world and you're speaking Spanish with people, no one is going to say like, hmm, that verb was in the preterite and it should have been in the imperfect. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I was like, no, Mm -hmm. they'll be just really happy that you're making the effort to talk to them in their language, you know? So that's what I try and get them to do when they're out, you know, in the community is like, try it, speak in Spanish. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. And you know, that... That's interesting because so I work with a lot of uh, guys from Argentina and women, but mostly men, actually. Um, We're in IT. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, people that I work with, they'll become self-conscious of their English Mm -hmm. and they speak fine English. There's nothing wrong with it, but maybe it might take a second or a word will be wrong. But I think a lot of people have been so trained that if they don't speak perfect English, they're going to be considered less than, and that's the fault. I think a lot of it has to do with American culture, but it's true. Like if you make an effort to speak in another language, you don't really get made fun of. I'd say maybe in Paris, it's a little bit different, Probably. Like <laughs> <laughs> but with the Spanish language countries, uh, what I found too, is like, I lived in Madrid just for three months and I don't have good Spanish at all, but I had to try mm-hmm. and I didn't get made fun of. I mean, I had to do some gestures. I, uh, I tried to order chicken breast and I won't even say what my gesture ended up being to explain <laughs> what part of the chicken I wanted. But, um, you know, I did find like people are just kind about it. And I think that's, I think it'd be important or a good thing if the P- Americans and people who are native English speakers could also have compassion for people when they're speaking a language that's not even their native one. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I joke with my students all the time. So my Spanish is kind of a mix of lots of different places because I lived in Spain, but, you know, I've attended school here in in the United States and Southern California predominantly. So most of my teachers here have been from Mexico or Central America. And then I lived for a year in Panama. So I have like a conglomeration of a bunch of different like words and my accent is a little different and stuff. And so when I go to, so I lived in Panama for a year and in Panama, like one of the reasons I felt so comfortable there is a lot of the people look like me are kind of a different shades of brown and white and, you know, everything. So I look like I could be Panamanian, but then when I start speaking, obviously I'm speaking Spanish, but my Spanish doesn't sound the same as theirs. And they're always like, where are you from? (laughs) I'm like, I'm from the United States. And they're like, why do you speak Spanish? I was like, because I learned it. And I uh, most a lot of people in Panama speak English. And so I'm like, do you speak English? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, how did you learn it? They're like, in school, watching TV, this. I was like, I learned Spanish the same way, you yeah. know. And, but sometimes they would feel like, oh, my English isn't good. I was like, your English is fine. I worked yeah. in Panama at a private Spanish school for travelers, right? So they'd be traveling, they'd come to Panama to learn Spanish and my job was to coordinate volunteer activities for them because a lot of them would come and be like, oh, I want to help out in the community and also learn Spanish. So I'd be like, fine. So one day I was in the office with my colleagues, Panamanian, we're speaking in Spanish. 
and a customer, new student comes in. And so I switch to English to, you know, help her like make all of her arrangements and stuff. <laughs> I'm like, after like 10 minutes, she says, she's like, your English is so good. How long have you been <laughs> speaking it? And I said, oh, it's been about 35 years. You know, I think I got, got a grip on it. And she like, looked at me kind of like confused. I was like, I'm American. <laughs> and she was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's great. You know, like, thanks for the compliment. You know, sometimes I still get my there and there confused, but I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I, well, yeah. And, hey, people, American people who have only speak English get their your and your confused yeah. as I've pointed out to them on Facebook many times. And there's nothing um, that makes you feel dumber as an American. This happened to me than when you live in England and someone asks you something in English and you're like, I don't know what this person just said. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So like the word pants means underwear here. So one time I went into a store and I've tried to work this into comedy and it just doesn't work that well, but I really did. I went in and said, Oh, Hey, I need some gray pants. And they Uh-oh. looked at me like, why are you? That's like, no, I didn't want gray underwear, which is a specific request. I really wanted like trousers. And I had to figure out why the lady looked at me so strangely. And then, and kind of, she was almost offended. Like I just came in this loud American asking for underwear, you know, hey, I need underwear. Great. But yeah. So then they use a lot of words here. I, I look things up actually sometimes. Yeah. I had to learn what a fortnight was when I was there. Cause I, oh. I didn't know that. And I was, I was in one of my classes and they were doing the like orientation. They're like, Oh yeah, we're going to have these review sessions fortnightly. And I thought to myself, yeah. I, when is that? I don't know. How often. Yeah. Like, okay. Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I know. I, I'm in a graduate level course. And I don't know what this guy is saying. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, you definitely have to learn a different version of English over here. Uh, Which, yeah, it's nice, actually, that you understand about that. So switching gears, one thing that I think is cool uh, is that you went on a, you changed your, like, idea about fitness and lifestyle and stuff. And I think that's something I've definitely still struggle with, um, and I have different friends who are in different stages of that. So just if you want to talk a little bit about outside of work and, and your um, activism and everything within the union, maybe just like personally, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So I went, I mentioned I went to Panama for a year and I kind of had a little like I went there because I was just not happy in my life. I wanted to change, blah, blah, blah. And I had an interaction with a guy that I was in a relationship with who made a comment about my weight. And, you know, it kind of stuck with me kind of in the way where part of you is like, F you, dude, I'm a strong woman. I can be however I want. But then also part of you is like, oh, you're not exactly wrong, you know. And anyway, I came back and I was like, I need to make some changes, you know. Um, For me, like the food side of it was pretty easy. And I mean, don't mean easy, but I always had a really good diet. I just ate too much food. So I just kind of had to do a better job of like monitoring that, which I did. Now it wasn't always easy. You know, as a teacher, there are, you know, you walk into the staff room and it's like, oh, cookie buffet at 8 a.m. Of course I need that, you know. (laughs) Oh, leftover pizza from this team's banquet? Sure. I need a post-lunch snack, you know, that kind of stuff. So you have to use a little little power. But the other side, the fitness, like it had never really been a part of my like lifestyle. I wasn't a workout person. I'd had some kind of not positive experiences with kind of group exercise classes, like in college and in my early twenties where, you know, being the biggest person there is not always comfortable or a teacher who, you know, doesn't believe in like modifications, you know, so I, I wasn't really into it. And So I realized I need to make some changes. I was doing like walking and running, whatever. And then one of my colleagues was like, hey, we've got this local studio. They're going to do a free spin class for all of us teachers. Like, come on, it'll be great. And I was like, okay, I'll try it, you know. And I went and I thought I was going to have a heart attack, like on the bike. I was like, I don't want my colleagues to just see me die. And then like have my principal have to like look me up (laughs) off the floor. Um, (laughs) But I survived. And at the end of the class, they raffled off a free month of classes. I won. And so I was like, okay, great. So I'm going to have to do this. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to keep going. 
And after like the fifth class, like I was hooked. And it was a local studio called Fit On Studios. Um, and this is like seven years ago, maybe now. Um, it owned by two women. And I started going and, you know, everyone was just so supportive. There were different types of people there, men, women, old, young. And they had different types of classes. They had bar classes. So I started taking bar classes. Uh, they had a teacher who was getting her yoga certification. So she gave some yoga classes. So I really just started you know, doing that. And, you know, then you start to see the physical changes too. But for me, it was more first those kind of mental and physical changes in terms of like, wow, I'm feeling stronger. I, and so I started doing yoga also. And I kind of started to look at my body in a different way, right? Because it's like, oh, wait, I can't do this one thing. But it's not about can I do this? It's like, oh, let me keep practicing this. Oh, wow, I can kind of lift this more than I could before. Or like, wow, this pose is kind of good for me. Like this feels strong, whatever. And so just kind of looking at your body in a different way. And, you know, it started giving me confidence. And I had never like in the fitness zone had never had confidence before. Um, And so I just kept going and, you know, taking different classes that really challenged me. I took a couple of these boot camp classes that I never would have like in a million years done. Um, but I, I also realized like I made judgments about people who would do that type of class. Like this mm-hmm. boot camp class I did was taught by this woman named Marie, who's like the Swedish woman. She's like 5'11, you know, just like muscle to the max, you know, like long blonde hair and like, you know, wearing tight outfits. And, you know, you make a judgment of like, this lady's not going to help me or she's going to think I'm too fat and slow and this, whatever. Couldn't have been, you know, more wrong. She was just the best coach and supported me through the whole thing, you know, and really had like a positive impact on me to the point where I was like, I hate you because this workout is so hard, but I also love you because you are really, you know, trying to help me reach my goals. So, yeah, I kept, you know, I was there all the time. Sadly, due to COVID, they've closed now. Um, But, you know, I've continued. I got my Peloton. So I'm here, you know, doing that. Um, but yeah, I, if you would have asked me like probably six years ago, if I could ever picture myself where like my fitness routine was one of the most important like things in my schedule, I would have been like, I don't know who you were talking about. Cause that's not Sarah. Yeah. But now it is, you know? Yeah. So for you, it was just really about being disciplined about working out. Yeah. And I think also I started to look at it not as like a punishment. I think I had had that in the past before of like, I have to punish myself because I'm fat. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's and if I like feel terrible after working out, like, okay, that's good. Or like, Ooh, I had a slice of cake. Gotta go run. Yeah. That, but now like the exercise is like almost my treat of like, Mm -hmm. Oh God, I've got to get through these four zoom meetings then I can go do my workout, you know? So it's almost like a treat now. And it's something I look forward to. It's, you know, it lets me like zone out. I'm just like, I'm going to just listen to this music that's on this class and, you know, just go with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And the Peloton actually that that's funny. My friends got one. Well, like many people, actually two of my friends got one over the, the last year. And um, some of them were on Strava together. So it's funny to see see like the classes they go to they actually sound fun I'm like oh I'm kind of like listening to a podcast riding around the park maybe I should start listening to share (laughs) (laughs) it's funny to each their own I have a good friend and so we did kind of a a running thing when we're preparing I did a half marathon and I've got to have music when I run like I need to have music it's got to be the right music she was the opposite. She teaches science. And she's like, oh, no, I listen to like these like science podcasts. She's like, it really gets me going when I'm running. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, OK, well, that, that's like all those did you like all the women who are after Fauci, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, all right. I mean, he's cute, but yeah. he's an man. I don't know. Who can't throw a baseball. <laughs> no, you can't throw a baseball. You're right. He cannot. It's like, you cannot throw a baseball, but yeah, no, I like, I like music or I have a certain podcast I listen to when I'm on my bike because they crack me up and I look like I'm nuts because right. I'll start laughing so hard. 
And I kind of like it because it just keeps people a little bit further away from you. Yeah, you know? that's a good one. I'm listening to uh, President Obama's book on my walks now, but I got to put him on 1.25 or I'm like, I'll never get to the end of this. I do that too. And I'll tell you, I listen back to each of my episodes just to make sure everything's all right, you know, after I edited it. And I listen to it fast and I don't even recognize my voice. <laughs> I'm like, so weird, you know, but I do the same thing. I listen to Keep It. It's this podcast on Crooked Media. It's like a pop culture one. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know, they're great, but they say the most savage thing. So it's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Um, that's cool. And uh, yeah, the book on tape. So just, I don't know, you're an educator. So maybe you know more about, I'll say you know more about reading and the importance of it. But also like, do you find, I haven't done that yet. And I know a lot of people like books on tape. I'm one of those purists that says you need to read it. I'm not so pure. It has to be a paper book. I use Kindle. But what do you think of books on I'm, I'm not a huge audiobook proponent. Um, this one, uh, President Obama's, is actually, I think, only the second one I've actually listened to. And I chose it just because he's narrating it. So I'm like, oh, I want to hear him talk for like 19 hours. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm not an audiobook fan. I mean, yeah. I think it's good to me. It's not the same as reading. Like to me, I put audiobooks and podcasts in the same you know, like thing like, yeah, they're great information. You know, I'm listening, I'm learning, but it's not the same because I don't feel like you can save the information and go back and look like, you know, a good book. I'll reread parts of a, a good book over and over. And with an audiobook, I don't feel like I can't retain the information in the same way. Yeah. No, I feel like that, too. And I just thought of something. So if you're listening to President Obama at 1.25 speed, it's kind of like just a normal. Almost. Yeah, it is. It really is almost like. <laughs> Because it's just, he has so many pauses and it just takes out those pauses. So he just like keeps going. <laughs> yeah, I should talk more like him and it'd be easier to listen to me later. Oh, that's great. So um, basically, let's see, I have like this fun five series of questions that I want to ask you. But first, before that, do you have any like advice or mantra or something that you like to share with people that you like just to... Um, you know, one of my with? kind of like the quotes I kind of live by one of my personal heroes is Roberto Clemente and Mm. he said translate to English that basically if you don't use your time here to help others you're wasting your time on earth and so that that's something that that I go back to a lot is like what am I doing to help others and whether it's something small something big you know he and his life did things from just inviting Latin players over to his house for dinner when they were, you know, visiting from uh, on the opposite team to, you know, eventually he gave his life trying to um, help victims of the earthquake in Nicaragua. But just that idea of like, what are you doing with your life if you're not trying to help others? Oh, that's great. And in Spanish, do you? Um, Si si no ayudes a los que vienes detrás de ti, estás malgastando tu tiempo en la tierra. Cool. All right. Thank you. So the fun five, what is the oldest t-shirt you have and still wear? Ooh, and still wear. Um, let's see. Probably I have one from college that is my um, like graduation year, class of 2001, um, that I still can't, can't part with. I pull it out sometimes and it's like a double XL, but I still wear it. <laughs> Do you, I know, but even some shirts like from when we were really young, I'm like, how big were our clothes? <laughs> yeah. Right? It's so fun. Yeah. Um, all right. So a lot of people have said, and I don't know, you might have had, have experienced this, that it's been like Groundhog's Day most of the time because everything seems about the same uh, every day lately from 2020 and now in 2021. So if you had to have a song that woke you up every morning on your alarm clock, Bill Murray had I Got You, Babe by Sonny and Sharon, his alarm clock in that movie. What song would would it be? Oh, that's a good one. Well, I might go nostalgic because my dad, when we were kids, used to sing um, uh, Wake Up Everybody by Curtis Mayfield. Like part of it, he'd only sing like, wake up everybody, get your children in bed. So Mm -hmm. um, I might go with that just for like nostalgia purpose. Is. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's cool. All right. This one's just super important. Okay. Coffee or tea or neither? 
Uh, I drink coffee every single day and probably have since I was like 14 years old when my mom started. My mom started me drinking coffee um, because when uh, we were in high school, our high school started at 730 in the morning. Yes. And I lived in canning country, which meant I had to leave my house at like seven. And I would get home from softball practice and be really tired and I couldn't do all my homework at night. And she was like, why don't you just go to bed early? I'll wake you up in the morning and you can finish your homework in the morning. So she would wake me up at like 5 a.m. I would do my homework and she would give me coffee. And so since then, I uh, drink coffee every single day. But I also like tea. I drink tea, too. But coffee is my go-to. All right. Cool. When was a time that you remember that you just laughed so hard you cried or you just couldn't stop or maybe something that makes you do that, like if you recall it? Um, It's funny you say that because that's actually when people ask me about teaching. That's one of the things I say about it is that everyone has stuff in their job that sucks. They're like, I hate that. But not everyone has parts of their job that make them cry so hard, laugh so hard that they're crying. And that happened to me in the classroom one time. And when we were doing this activity, um, it was like kids were doing uh, like these little acrostic poems with other kids' names in class. So like you would have filled out a little survey of like things you like, your favorite color, whatever, and then you'd give it to me. And now I'm writing a little poem about Rabia with like R, you know, Rubia, because you're blonde, whatever. Hmm. And <laughs> this girl was working on it. And one kid had said that they liked cats. So she was writing it. And then she was drawing a little cat. And she called me over and she was like, uh, Senorita, what do you think about this cat? I think it looks kind of like a devil. <laughs> I looked at it and it was like the worst drawing of a cat I had ever seen. Like, it was so bad. And I was trying to hold it in. I was like, oh, no, you're fine. And she looks at me just with, like an earnest face. She's like, it's okay to laugh. It's terrible. And I just started laughing so hard. And then I was crying. And then other kids were like, why are you laughing? And then she's showing the picture. And other kids, some of them tried to be nice too. They're like, it's not so bad. And then other kids are like, no, that's terrible. You can't give it to her. And like, it, I just could not stop. Like I had to go outside and be like, I can't look at you guys right now because I'm laughing so hard. Yeah. That's awesome. That's fun. Yeah. I wonder if she just like never, like she's afraid of picking her. <laughs> Maybe. I hope I not start her as an artist for life, but yeah, it was rough. <laughs> that's cool. All right. And my last one, uh, who inspires you right now? Oh, um, I would say definitely, um, some of my students inspire me right now, just like hearing some of the stuff that they're having to deal with, you know, on their own at home, whether it's, you know, a difficult family economic situation, um, or, you know, uh, they're just struggling of not being able to spend time with their friends not being able to, you know, those kids who are seniors who are, you know, going to miss all of that stuff, but mm-hmm. they're really still trying and they're trying to make the best of it. Um, and so they're the ones who inspire me to like, keep trying my best. Cause there are definitely days where I'm just like, let me just give them this worksheet. I don't want to do this, you know, but yeah. um, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to do the best for them. So yeah, they're definitely, inspiring me these days and really just you know the stuff that they're going through and hearing the stuff that's important to them you know just the other day we had a question in class of like what are your wishes for the next four years and you know to hear what they're saying is is inspirational you know so yeah they're definitely uh keeping me going that's awesome all right is there anything you want to say as the last thing at all or promote um no I would just say to all of your listeners out there to support public education um in any way that you can you know whether it's supporting teachers whether it's talking to your kids about how important public education is um I just think that that is something like I I don't we don't need pats on the back right we don't need like a little like you're the best teacher sticker, you know, like we really need people to value our profession um, and public education as a whole, like they value Wall Street and the stock market and that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So that's just what I'd say is tell a public educator that you appreciate the work that they do. Great. Yeah. And I hope some are listening too and get to hear about the inspiring things you're doing outside of the classroom. Well, Sarah, this has been 
really awesome. So yeah. thank you so much for joining me and talking through some of the tougher things through. Yeah. I appreciate it's it. It's been so great. I was so excited to hear from you. And, um, you know, I'm, it's it's been really cool. Such a great opportunity. Thanks for joining me this week. You can find out more about our guest in the show notes. The music you're probably moving to by now is by Joe Mafia. Find him on Spotify. That's Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. And Rob Meckie is responsible for our visual design. You can find him online by searching for Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Thanks, Rob. Let us know who you'd like to hear from or about your own experiences defining yourself outside of work at More Than Work Pod on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Give us a follow. Or visit our website at RobbiaSaid.com. Subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening to More Than Work. We'll be back next week with another guest. In the meantime, while being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself. Thank you.